Welcome to LSE IQ. I'm Oliver Johnson, and this is the podcast where we ask social scientists and other experts to answer one intelligent question. The project to sequence the first human genome was launched in 1990 and took 13 years to complete. Today, biomedical techniques mean that the sequencing of a human genome can be done in less than 24 hours at a tiny fraction of the cost. Similar advances in other biomedical technologies along with electronic health records and the information we generate through our mobile phones, smartwatches or Fitbits, our social media posts and search engine queries, mean that there's a torrent of information about our bodies, our health and our diseases out there. Alongside this, the tremendous growth in computing power and data storage means that this big data can be stored and aggregated and then analysed by sophisticated algorithms for connections, comparisons and insights. The promise of all of this is that big data will create opportunities for medical breakthroughs, help tailor medical interventions to us as individuals, and create technologies that will speed up and improve healthcare. And of course, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've also seen some countries use data, generated from people's mobile phones, to track and trace the disease. All of this poses opportunities for the tech giants and others who want to be part of the gold rush for our data and to then sell solutions back to us. In 2019, Google found itself embroiled in a scandal when it was discovered that it had accessed the health details of millions of unaware US patients through a deal with the major healthcare provider, Ascension. Google is working with Ascension, the second largest healthcare system in America. Ascension agreed to give Google access to the names, dates of birth, and medical histories of 50 million patients without informing them or their doctors. What are the risks in handing over our most personal data? Will it allow big data to deliver on its hype? And is it a fair exchange? In this episode of LSE IQ, I ask, is big data good for our health? I'm a doctor by background, so anaesthetics and intensive care was my my bag. So I practiced clinically for five years. I was always a very, uh, how to put this, I suppose, in a politically correct way. I, I never loved medicine, but I loved solving problems. And it meant that I, whilst I enjoyed treating patients, what I enjoyed more was actually solving problems in the hospital. This is Dr. James Somaru, an expert in health and technology and host and producer of the Health Tech Podcast. After leaving the NHS, James did various roles before ending up as the director of a health tech accelerator called Digital Health London. This supports startups developing digital solutions to some of the challenges facing London's NHS and helps to get them adopted. James has now set up his own health tech accelerator called Somex. I asked him what big data and the digital technology it enables has brought to healthcare. Technology should allow for eyes off paperwork and eyes on patients that's that's what i believe the role of technology in healthcare is and that's what i believe it is doing in the best use cases and i believe that it's what it will continue to do in future now if you talk about big data specifically or you know we're talking about things like ai machine learning and things like that what you what you're essentially doing is you're taking all of the processing power of clinicians minds and you're getting that done with greater accuracy and greater speed through machines and computers. That's how I see it. If you consider the point that what makes a consultant better than a junior, it's experience. But that's essentially how you train an algorithm. You train an algorithm to be more experienced. And so why just give it the knowledge of one person over their lifetime which might be 40 50 years and there's a there's a load of companies doing this right so consider skin analytics so they're doing ai machine learning for dermatology neil daly's the founder and it's the case that his algorithm has been trained on the hundreds thousands millions of different images and that is far more than a consultant will see in a lifetime so therefore it will learn and is learned now obviously it has to be labeled correctly and all the rest of it which obviously there's plenty of teams doing that for him um but but that's the notion right that you, you take away the necessity of that processing and memory and reliance upon experience and you double down on the fact that actually we now trust this algorithm to do that Hi, I'm Neil from Skin Analytics, and we've developed a way to enable smartphones to detect changes to skin features. 
So we first focus on building a product around melanoma, and that's because detecting changes to skin features like moles is the best way that you can find cancer. So we get people to take photographs of their moles at suitable periods, typically between two or three months, and then we compare those images using our technology. In fact, Derm AI, the machine learning tool developed by Skin Analytics, is so successful that research published in one of the leading US medical journals, JAMA, showed that when 1,550 images of suspicious and benign skin lesions were analyzed by the artificial intelligence algorithm, Derm diagnosed skin cancer with the same accuracy as clinical specialists. There it is. So, you know, it is it is happening and it's not only happening in dermatology and bear in mind, you know, for dermatology, it's, it's relatively perhaps more straightforward because you're looking at images of, let's say, uh, so his is for skin cancers, right? So melanomas. So you're looking at that melanoma for size, shape, you're looking at the colors, you're looking at the edges you're looking at some some nice well-defined characteristics there uh, and it's somewhat of a cleaner model you can encode an algorithm with essentially the same level of knowledge and learning that a consultant of 40 plus years of experience would have correct at Fibris, we try and build technology powered by ai that helps non-medical users diagnose complex diseases Another company called Febris uses artificial intelligence to help people with minimal medical training to diagnose diseases such as pneumonia. Its mobile-based software works by analysing information collected from devices such as digital stethoscopes. Digital stethoscopes essentially convert acoustic sound to electronic signals. These can be digitised and uploaded to a phone or computer. In this case, to be analysed by Febris's technology. So they're doing AI machine learning algorithm for respiratory disease, where they take data from off the shelf wearables, so Fitbits and the like, digital stethoscopes as well, but they're taking all those signals, feeding them into the algorithm and, you know, both predicting pneumonia before it happens, but also diagnosing whether something is pneumonia or not. So Febris have a clinic going on in rural India where a digital stethoscope is in the hands of a minimally trained health worker, i.e you know, not a doctor or something like that, someone who does not have that in-depth medical knowledge, but they can stick a digital stethoscope on a newborn baby who might be coughing and spluttering, and that digital stethoscope will say yes or no whether that baby is or might have very shortly pneumonia based on the sound of their lungs. That digital stethoscope in the hands of that person, that, that system can see 100, 200 patients a day doing that stuff and the point is it's sensitive and specific so it will not only correctly identify who's got the disease it'll also correctly identify who hasn't got the disease to over 90 percent accuracy i believe they've saved 10,000 lives in rural india they're they're working with the nhs to develop that in the uk and a version of the febris app is currently being rolled out to care homes in east london to help carers and health assistants identify health risks and deterioration within elderly communities in the midst of the current coronavirus crisis. So big data, coupled with enormous computing power, can train algorithms to do tasks as accurately and sometimes faster than an expert can. But it allows for even more than this. Barbara Prainsack, Professor of Comparative Policy Analysis at the University of Vienna and Professor of Sociology at King's College London, explained. Some people, when they use the word big data, Big, the term big data, they mean lots of information about lots of patients and at a very granular level. So lots of different types of information about people. When other people use the term big data, they mean so much data that we can't really process it anymore. It really, and, and when other people use the term big data, they mean a particular kind of inquiry, namely what we call hypothesis-free um, data mining. So instead of in the olden days where you would have an idea of how two things are connected and then you would study the pathway, in the big data era, you just have lots and lots and lots of data sets and you let the computer look for patterns. And then once you see patterns, you may or may not look into whether the patterns have some meaning. So for example, whether if you find a correlation between patient characteristics who recover particularly well after a surgery, you might look at 
why, why, how could this characteristic be connected to recovering well from surgery? So this is the first thing that we need to ask when we, when we talk about big data. Barbara is the author of a book, Personalized Medicine, Empowered Patients in the 21st Century. Personalized or precision medicine is one of the hopes which springs from big data, that information about a person's genes, environment and lifestyle will help tailor disease diagnosis, prevention and treatment. What we call big data includes a process that we don't talk about so much, which is the process of datafication. We talk a lot about digitization, so moving things from the analog world into the digital world. For example, instead of having doctor's notes on paper, we now have doctor's notes. In, we have it electronically. What we don't talk about so much is, 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 is datafication. What does datafication mean? It's, it's a very unelegant term. It means that we are capturing, in terms of data, things that we didn't capture before. So we are now capturing aspects in, ter in terms of digital data that were not recorded before. So we've always eaten lunches and we've always walked in the park and we've, some of us have always run on the beach. So nowadays we do that by bringing a phone that counts steps, that counts calories, uh, we enter mood diaries and so on and so on. We put pictures online. So all of those things mean that our bodies and lives are now datafied to a greater extent than before. And these data can be used to analyze various things about patients. And this is a resource that some visionaries of precision medicine consider a great opportunity to break new ground and to find out new things about health and disease at an individual level. But the big data promises also that we're creating lots of digital data sets by, you know, all the imaging data, the old x-rays were somewhere in a file and the new, the new imaging data are now available in digital format. And we can link. So linking is a very important term. We can link different types of data sets. We can link the images with information on, on your health status, information on your family histories, and on your activity profile. And that is the real promise of, of big data in healthcare. We can find new ways in which, or new, new, we can find out that some things make some people sick and maybe even why. Find out that some things keep some people healthy and then we need to ask why. And we can uh, find patterns between, we can, we can find connections between characteristics that we didn't even know were connected before. Another application of big data promises to provide an early warning system for the outbreak of infectious diseases such as COVID-19. Dr Stephen Roberts is a fellow in LSE's Department of Health Policy whose research focuses on the digitization of these surveillance systems. I would certainly say we're Ollie, we are witnessing uh, a resurgence in seeing how big data and artificial intelligence techniques are being uh, applied uh, for enhanced detection and, and, and patient tracking during this particular outbreak. So on one hand, uh, we have seen that big data has delivered again on uh, accelerated uh, detection. So this one example of this is that there is a, a Toronto-based startup company called Blue Dot, which essentially uses uh, advanced artificial uh, intelligence techniques to scan big data sources online to get better and quicker predictions of uh, disease outbreaks. So once again, Blue Dot was the first, it claims to be the first um, organization or business to uh, have detected the emergence of unusual pneumonia uh, happening within China in late December. So this again was was about a week in advance of the CDC and the WHO's kind of initial warnings that there were uh, unusual health events occurring within China. So on one hand, we can see that big data in many cases has delivered on the development of rapid new insights with infectious disease outbreaks. During this public health crisis, China is embarking on an unprecedented use of surveillance by using big data and its citizens. So what exactly is China's surveillance strategy and can it work to battle the epidemic? On the other hand, we've seen a really interesting use of AI techniques and also all sorts of technological innovations on part of the Chinese government, uh, including uh, AI techniques for contract tracing, uh, the use of, of web crawling techniques uh, on the internet, but also the use of drones 
uh, to enforce public health measures in China as well. I think what is probably most concerning is that what we've seen within the Chinese context of this disease outbreak is also the employing of all of these methods, the use of big data and the use of AI in ways that in many incidences, if we remember back to the quarantining of, of 50 to 60 million Chinese citizens, uh, really bringing big data into ways that come into direct conflict with you know, very strong concerns for human rights. So how is big data perhaps being used within this outbreak in a way that might come into conflict with human rights, you know, and, and the rights of the individual in the community, I think is also a really interesting conversation we need to be having. And this brings us to a major concern associated with big data. The collection of our personal information without our permission or the use of it for purposes that we have not agreed to. These have serious implications for our human rights, since data could be used to discriminate against people on the basis of gender, sexuality, ethnicity or race. It could also be used to stifle political dissent, for example. The issue of privacy in big data came to the fore in 2017, when the UK Information Commissioner's Office ruled that the Royal Free NHS Foundation Trust had failed to comply with the Data Protection Act when it provided patients' details to DeepMind an artificial intelligence company which is a subsidiary of Google. The trust transferred the personal data of around 1.6 million patients as part of a trial to test an app called Streams, an alert diagnosis and detection system for acute kidney injury. Stephen explained to me what the privacy concerns are around this kind of personal information. So I think when we talk about big data and what it can do to improve healthcare, we also need to be focusing on discussions of data security within these contexts. So what we've seen in recent years is these new data systems or these new data collection methods have been incredibly vulnerable to data hacks uh, and to data leaks. So a really serious example which illustrates uh, this discussion uh, was the hacking and the leaking of the Australian blood service several years ago, which in effect leaked highly, highly personable blood information and sexual information of uh, half a million Australians uh, that was made public. So when you consider the highly detailed and personal nature of what information is con contained in one's blood, it's very easy to see how unauthorized access to big medical data can easily lead to stigma and also to human rights abuses. Indeed, in 2019, when a whistleblower penned an article for the Guardian newspaper about their decision to speak up about Ascension Health sharing patient information with Google as part of Project Nightingale, they wrote, I can see the advantages of unleashing Google's huge computing power on medical data, but the disadvantages prey on my mind. Employees at big tech companies having access to personal information, data potentially being handed on to third parties, adverts one day being targeted at patients according to their medical histories. But could there be potential consequences of opting out of sharing your information in this way, if you have a choice? Here's Barbara Prainsack. So there's nothing wrong with these data being used, but it would, it would be problematic if we were to, to move towards a system where the, the contribution of all kinds of data and information about myself becomes a condition to getting good quality healthcare. So this is a problem for two reasons. First of all, some people don't trust healthcare systems. They don't trust the state. They don't, so they just don't want to share everything. And that those people still need to have access to healthcare, to good healthcare, clearly. But also some people are not really able to do that. Not everyone is able to, to, to make good decisions about what they want to share and, and, and to share information and data about themselves. So what do we do with those people? What do we do with underserved populations? Um, so if you are not represented in the data set that is, that is used to make, uh, to find out what types of people benefit from a particular treatment, then, or to develop a genetic test, then the test will not work for you. So not being included in the data set protects you in a way because if, when you're not in the data set then there are certain privacy risks that you don't have because your data have not been used but at the same time it also means that decisions that are taken are, are very often not applicable to you because you haven't been represented so that's that's one thing and there's there's a lot of work to to, to do in this domain to find out 
um, in our healthcare systems, how we find a good balance between requiring that people actively participate but, and making sure that even those that don't participate still have good access to healthcare. Stephen Roberts also has concerns about misplaced hype that can be associated with these technologies. Are they all what they're cracked up to be? So within the context of infectious disease surveillance, what I have noticed in my research is that in many cases, there have been many sort of enhanced reporting successes and detection of potential pandemics using big data and using new surveillance mechanisms. But at the same time, these are pilot projects, which in many areas have misfires, miscalculations and misinformation. So uh, many of these processes um, are being rolled out and in effect are being sort of just tested to see how well they work. I think Google flu trends uh, really kind of demonstrates the problems of uh, the needs for uh, nuance, yeah. verification and, and oversight. The only way to detect a flu epidemic was by accumulating information submitted by doctors about patient visits, a process that took about two weeks to reach the CDC. So the researchers turned it around. They asked themselves if they could predict a flu outbreak in real time simply using data from online searches. So they set out to do the near impossible, searching the searches. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, sort of the Google Flu Trends experiment, what in effect actually happened was uh, Google was using search query data to try and uh, track the prevalence of, of pandemic influenza. And essentially, the algorithms that it was using were then unable to uh, detect or know the difference between actual cases of influenza being inputted into search query data uh, compared with uh, spikes in search queries about influenza by interested parties during seasonal outbreaks. So there are a lot of technical issues um, with these techniques uh, and these technologies as well. Dr. Lisa Sapenko, Senior Lecturer in Practice in LSE's Department of Health Policy, is also uneasy about hype. She explained why this, and the lack of transparency, about how these algorithms are designed and work, are so problematic. Just as a quick aside, you'll hear her mention something called GitHub. At a very basic level, this is a platform which allows developers to share and collaborate on code. The problem is that currently big data solutions or the tools that are being generated are being positioned, being brought to the market as uh, solutions, as salvation, as uh, a great promise of a better future, better decision making that doctors currently do better than human factor. And uh, these are completely unsubstantiated claims. It sounds plausible, it sounds good, uh, but it hasn't been tested, it's not evidence-based. And the biggest problem that we currently have with algorithms and models that are being developed based on big data is uh, they are untested and uh, they are not properly validated and they are black boxes uh, where no one knows how these algorithms are built and how they operate. There are two problems to that because first of all, this is operational lack of transparency. Companies or researchers developing them do not put them on GitHub and they do not make them code accessible, but that's for, let's say, simplistic models that don't program themselves. When models start programming themselves, we have another problem when the researchers themselves do not understand what is going inside that black box that generates those decisions. And uh, that lack of opaqueness and transparency is a real problem. So the model gives us some results based on the data that we fed, but we don't know how they were generated. And um, a model is built by humans and humans are biased and imperfect so by default they are building in their views uh, their biases into the algorithms and there is a huge risk of them eventually keeping programming themselves into even more difficult biased situations so the only way to improve on models the only way to keep them healthy reflective of the real situation is constant feedback and transparency so that's why the current model that we have let's take a data set and train the algorithm on it or build a model on it and take it into practice is a dangerous assumption. We need a constant living system which is constantly learning and updating not just on the new data but all on the feedback of people using that model. Barbara Prainsack agrees. We're using data sets in, for research that were not collected for research purposes. So increasingly, people also use clinical data now for research purposes. But clinicians collect data 
not in a quality controlled way to feed it into a research database, but initially they collected it just for themselves to, to provide clinical care. One thing that, that gets a little bit neglected in this debate that is especially when doctors and nurses are entering data in a database, this is where the beginning of the so-called GIGO problem starts. GIGO stands for garbage in, garbage out. If we get bad quality data in the system, then this is what we have to work with. Ultimately, Google, DeepMind, Apple are all corporate companies with an eye on the bottom line. I asked James Somaru if these innovations would benefit people equally. It is a common argument, though, and, and, and rightly so, that, you know, is all this new tech just going to help the rich in the rich countries who can afford the wearables and this, that, and the other? Well, yes, if you think of it B2C, if you think of, you know, consumers directly buying this stuff, fine, they're going to test it. And yes, the private sector can afford this stuff more so than the public sector. But actually, if the private sector buys things, proves that it works proves that it's high quality and delivers a good experience for patients, but more importantly, improves efficiency. If the private sector buys it, takes the risk and proves that, then actually you make a case for the public sector adopting things and actually making things better and all the rest of it. So, uh, and making it more efficient and saving money for the public sector, which can be deployed elsewhere and, and all the rest of it. So yes, I take the point that tech can be expensive, but those that do take that risk and see those rewards, and they may not, they might take that risk and it fails, but actually... If they take the risk and they see the rewards, well, actually, the other health economies can learn from that. So I think there's, yeah, there's definitely value in it. Although I, I, I do still take the point that, yes, we could be better at democratizing it. What can be done to tackle these challenges with big data? Here's Lisa. The question comes is, are you trying to resolve these problems using integrity, transparency, fairness, um, communication and collaboration? Or are you telling that give me your data, we'll go and magically do something with it and to bring you the solution, uh, which you will not be able to refuse. And the latter is exactly the business model of all the companies currently dealing with data. And um, there's nothing we can do there because calling for responsibility or regulation, this will not work. It's only my my thinking is we have only hope for people uh, on the other side of the equation who decide to give this data. So perhaps this is a call for executives of the hospitals, executives of the healthcare systems who decide to participate in these collaborations. And I think they should because we need to move forward. So I'm not against the collaboration, but I'm for responsibility. And um, executives need to demand from these companies complete transparency. And they need to understand that people dealing with data do not closely understand the problems that healthcare is having. They are might they might be excellent professionals in terms of uh, data management. Some of them might have medical degrees, but it, they have not worked in those environments. So that's why it's not about giving data to an IT company. It's about giving data and people from hospitals, people working on front lines, people going to Google and saying, this is what I face on a daily basis. This is, these are the problems. These data don't work. This is subjective. We have many opinions and one person may react this way and another person may react this way. And it's only this kind of collaboration which can eventually bring solutions that will work rather than uh, this kind of model will give you the data and you'll bring us something back tomorrow. So, yeah, so it's responsibility. It's some level of regulation which government needs to enforce on the players. Constant validation, standardization and experimentation. So these are not, not of the cell solutions. These are living systems which will take us many years to perfect. For Barbara Prainsack, regulating these companies and their handling of data is incredibly important. I, th I think it's perfectly legitimate to have commercial interests that motivate you if you still do something good as well. So I, I'm not against commercial providers of, 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 of health apps and wearables and so on and so on. Where it comes a problem is when the benefits are overstated, overpromised, especially when you have to do with people who might be desperately looking for something to help them. 
Um, when you then take money from those people for things that might actually not help them. And when you use data from these gadgets, from these apps, from these platforms, merely to create financial profits. And for the last, well, actually for all of those problems, there's one solution. The solution is called regulation. So it, it really doesn't cease to amaze me to what extent we are all getting together and, and, uh, and throwing our hands in the air and saying, this is so terrible what Facebook is doing. It's so terrible what uh, Google is doing. It's so terrible what X and Y are doing. And we're not just saying, okay, then let's outlaw this particular practice. James Summeru agrees. He argues the small companies he works with have an advantage over the tech giants. I sit in a position where I'm trying to help the little guy. I'm trying to help the small startups. I'm trying to help the people that have the good motives. And so actually, whilst I'm aware of these things going on, I'm also aware of the regulations that these people should be a a applying to and and. I make sure that they're signed up to that. And so that's my position in the ecosystem of helping them. Now, those, the little guy in this scenario, the small startups do have advantages over the Googles and the Apples in the sense that they can make human relationships with people in organizations and get data sets or at least do deals and, and you know, get small trials and all the rest of it with, with certain organizations and, and a few patients here and there so they can test their the things a lot better it goes without saying that that the big companies acquiring all this data have to handle it correctly it, it, it literally goes without saying there's no point in getting into that and mistakes have been made and things have been corrected but it's one of those that the regulators are always going to be slow to catch up because tech moves incredibly quickly and regulation always takes a while to catch up it, it's a tough one is big data good for our health is it just unsubstantiated hype and how concerned should we be that information about us is being used to develop these digital health technologies. For Stephen Roberts, the issue is one of proper oversight. I think there's a lot of excitement and a lot of promise and potential around big data. But again, I think it comes back to really sort of very critical social science questions that we think about. So who is involved in uh, handling this data? Who processes the data? Who has the financial, uh, the technical and the scientific capacities to capture this data and, and to make it speak and produce these insights. And if we come back to that, we need to be thinking about the actors that are involved in uh, data management, looking at data, as we said as well, but also who is around the table in terms of talking about what are the perimeters that, when we're using this data, that, that it can be looked at. So who is allowed to leverage this data? What data sources are off the table, for example, that cannot be looked at? You know, can data be, be traded and regulated as a commodity? These are the questions that I think are really essential in having and making sure that these conversations and these constant sort of, you know, critical observations are not lost in the celebrations of big data. Lisa Sapenko echoes this. So for research, I see tremendous value of big data because once again, if a properly used methodologically sound research is taking place, big data can really help point us in the direction of important questions to explore, to point us to maybe rare adverse events, future discoveries. Uh, so if it's supplemented with current hypothesis generating research, this is tremendous potential. The second uh, powerful implementation of big data is once again with objective data where we have good amounts of data to improve efficiency of services, delivery of services, to make our operations more efficient. Um, that also can save clinicians time, uh, reduce errors. So these solutions should be tested. When Big claims come from big data, delivering personalized solutions, personalized diagnosis, saving resources, making people healthier. Uh, we need to be very careful and uh, question people making such claims uh, because we have no evidence that this is currently possible. This requires a lot of exploration, which I support. I think we should go in that direction, but with transparency and with methodological rigor and control. And when these solutions are brought to the market, they're not brought in the newspaper headlines. They are brought in the setting of a clinical trial. These solutions need to be, if for example, one hospital adopts a particular algorithm or a particular solution, either they 
use only half staff to use the new solution and have done to have some subgroup of patients or they do cluster trials where they implement it in one hospital and they fit they find um a very similar hospital where they don't have that solution and they do a properly sized properly powered long enough trial to see real outcomes on patient relevant outcomes so once again we need to employ big data but in a way that it helps us rather than it um, costs a lot of money to develop these solutions and we're giving up all our privacy and um, patient records in return to black box algorithms um, that's not a fair exchange for Barbara Prainsack, the promise of personalised medicine will take more than the technological solutions offered by big data. I think we should use information and data about people wisely. Decisions in our healthcare systems should not be data-driven, but knowledge-driven. Knowledge requires more than data. Um, we need to really invest into people, healthcare professionals, having the time to talk to patients, making sure that the data that are collected are good. Um, having time and expertise to interpret the information and the data that we're collecting. And we should never, ever trust that big data alone can, can solve problems in our healthcare system. So personalized medicine for the benefit of people would be a type of medicine that sees the whole patient, the whole person, both her body, her, her lifestyle, her beliefs, her needs, her socioeconomic circumstances, and tries to improve these for the patient, but also tries to create societies that are more just, so that some of the health problems and some of the bad health outcomes that come from social and economic disparities can be prevented at the root of the, of the problem. And for James Summeru, the digital aspect of healthcare will one day no longer be extraordinary supplementing rather than doing away with the care and expertise of doctors and other health practitioners. Can digital health improve our health? Well, actually, you know, I'm starting to hear this phrase a lot more, which particularly from the investor side of the world, which is at some point, digital health is just going to be health. You don't call it digital banking on your phone. You don't call you can't call it digital anything else that you do. If you're talking about healthcare in general, absolutely. Because as I say, you know, going right back to my sort of first law of health tech, if you want to call it that, which is that it should uh, emancipate people from their, from the, from the admin of their data, actually give them the chance to care. That's what people want from healthcare. I've worked on the front line as a doctor. People want to be cared for. So I think roles will change. I think it will be a part of the team. In those situations, it'll be a very smart member of the team. But there's so much about delivering care for people, which is nuanced in the art of medicine. Things like, you know, I spoke to a GP once who I asked him this this question, actually, even when I was a medical student, when I was thinking about this stuff. And he said to me, the thing is, though, you know, I know that Mrs. Smith, who's Islamic, play, prays five times a day. If I give her a medication to take five times a day she'll take it when she prays and i know she'll take it and she'll adhere to it well the machines know that think about where you receive your healthcare as well you know you don't just want technology telling you you've got cancer tell us what you think using the hashtag lseiq this episode of lseiq was produced by natalie abbott james Ratti, sue winderbank and myself oliver johnson want to explore more about health and big data this episode was based, in part, on the following research. Big Data, Algorithmic Governmentality and the Regulation of Pandemic Risk, 2019, by Stephen Roberts. Blockchain's Potential to Improve Clinical Trials, 2019, by Lisa Sapenko. Personalized Medicine, Empowered Patients in the 21st Century, 2017, by Barbara Prainsack. Join us next time when we ask, how can we tackle air pollution? For more episodes of this podcast and to subscribe, please visit lse.ac.uk forward slash IQ or search for LSE IQ in your favourite podcast app. And please consider leaving us a review as this makes the podcast easier for new listeners to discover.